Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. Mark chapter 6, 1 through 13 is the section we're going to look at today, and it's really two different episodes. The first few verses talk about when Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, preached in the synagogue there, and was largely rejected by those who knew him best. And then it transitions into the section where Jesus sends out his apostles two by two to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to proclaim the kingdom. Now, at first glance, these two episodes might not really seem to be linked thematically, but one of the things I'm going to demonstrate, hopefully to you, is that there actually is a progression from his rejection at Nazareth to his sending out of the apostles. What we're going to see here is really a small picture of a much larger theme that has Old Testament echoes, and we certainly see this in the rest of the New Testament as well, that where there is rejection of Jesus, there is also belief by some and an expansion and continuation of the people of God. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how the church certainly does not replace Israel. The church is Israel continued and expanded. And that expansion is primarily due to Gentiles who are, who are brought into the people of God, that is, the people of Israel. So let's begin by kind of setting the stage here by looking at what happened leading up to Mark chapter 6. Because it's important to keep in mind that in several of the episodes leading up to Mark chapter 6, everything seems to be going pretty well for Jesus. So here's what happens. In Mark 4, 35 through 41, he rebukes the storm, and of course he amazes his disciples— Transitioning into chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, he cast demons into swine. Of course, he, he cast the demons out of the man who was possessed by them. Mark 5, 25 through 34 talks about his healing of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. That was a reading last Sunday. And joined to that reading was Mark 5, 21 through 24 and 35 through 43, where he raises Jairus' daughter back to life. Now we're going to get to Mark 6, 1 through 6, and we're going to see that all of these episodes leading up to this, where there was a, a, a positive action or a, an amazing response, a, a positive amazing response on the part of Jesus' disciples, all of that is going to be then matched or mismatched, we might say, by his rejection at Nazareth. So let's talk about kind of the way this starts out. Because what happens when Jesus gets to his hometown? These are the first, first couple of verses in Mark 6. Jesus went away from there. That is, he went away from Capernaum, where he had been, which is kind of his base of operations around the Sea of Galilee. He went away from there, and he came to his hometown, that is, of Nazareth. Mark doesn't specify the name of his hometown, but of course we know that from elsewhere. So he goes to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now, let's kind of get in our mind's eye the place that Jesus is at. So this first image shows you just kind of a, as, the, as the crow flies, as it were, where Jesus would have been traveling from Capernaum, which is on the, the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, down to Nazareth, which, as you can see, is positioned just about halfway between the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee. It's about a 25, 26 miles, mile walk from Capernaum to Nazareth. This is another image that shows you probably the route that Jesus and his disciples would have taken. You see Capernaum, which is circled in red on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and then the purple road leading down to Nazareth, which, of course, is where Jesus grew up. Now, one thing just to briefly comment on is a synagogue. Uh, we're so used to reading about synagogues in the New Testament that we probably don't always pause to say to ourselves, you know what? I don't remember once reading about synagogues in the Old Testament, and that'd be because they're not there. Or if they were there, they're certainly never mentioned. Uh, the, the origin of synagogues is, is kind of lost in, in history, as it were. Most scholars assume that synagogues began either during the Babylonian exile or certainly after the Jews returned in 538 from the Babylonian exile, at least some of the Jews returned. So sometimes in what's often called the, the intertestamental period or the Second Temple period, sometime during those centuries, synagogues began to emerge here and there, so that by the time you get to the New Testament, during these intervening years between the, the closing book of the Old Testament and the opening of Matthew, you've got synagogues all over the place. Jesus is visiting them in the Holy Land, of course, in the book of Acts, and then later in Paul's epistles, he's going all over the place, and he's stopping at synagogues in order to preach there. So synagogues were basically this building 
where the local Jews would gather in order to hear the word read and and preached and taught. Uh, worship would have taken place in the synagogues. It was also sort of a, a, a community center, if you will, for the Jews. So synagogues, by the time we get to the New Testament, are going to function in God's providential plan to spread the news of Jesus the Messiah. Because as Paul will travel around through what's called the diaspora, that is the, 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 the area to which the Jews spread in the Roman Empire, as he travels through the diaspora to places we read about in the New Testament, he often stops at synagogues. Why? Because this is where Jews and some God-fearing Gentiles, they would gather, and Paul was a traveling rabbi, a traveling teacher, and so they would invite him to speak, and he would have a chance then to proclaim that this Messiah, promised in the Tanakh, promised in the Old Testament, has come, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. So synagogues functioned in God's plan as a means of evangelizing those who had been waiting for the Messiah, and of course, those who had never heard of him, and yet this was the chance for Paul to proclaim him to those who were listening. Okay, so that's the opening. Let's see what happens as Jesus begins to teach, how the people react to him. Next, we read this. Many, and I kind of line this up to where you can see the questions that are about to come. So, many who heard him were astonished, Ekplaso is the Greek verb used there, which you can see to the right, sometimes translated astonished, sometimes translated amazed, and mostly positive, but in this case, we're going to see it's a negative astonishment. So they were ekplaso, they were astonished or amazed, and what did they say? They, they said a series of questions. Where did this man get these things? Which in Greek is pothentuto tauta. Back years ago when I took Greek, my professor translated that as, where does he get this stuff? <laughs> so where, where's this guy get these things from? And next they ask, what is the wisdom given to him? Next, how were such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, tectone? We'll talk about that Greek word in just a minute. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? By the way, this is the only time in the New Testament where Jesus is referred to as the son of Mary in those explicit words. Isn't this the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense. Skandalizo is the Greek verb that's used there. You, that's where we get our word scandal or scandalized from. And they were scandalized, or they were religious, deeply religiously offended at him. You can see on the right, skandalizo is translated all sorts of different ways, depending on the context in the New Testament. Offense, stumble, sin, anything like that. They're, they're religiously, deeply offended at him. Why were they offended at him? And, and, and kind of what's going on here? What, what were, the, what were the, the reasons for their objections to him? One of the things that they say is, hey, we know all about this guy. We, it, he is the tectone. He is the carpenter. So that's an interesting word. Of course, we're very familiar with uh, thinking of Jesus as, as a carpenter. However, this particular Greek word is much broader than that. Uh, I, I, tongue in cheek, I wrote, Jesus worked in the tech industry. Forgive me for that. But uh, we get, of course, our word tech from technology, and we get our English words that are all about tech from the root of tectone. So a tectone is an artisan. It's, it's a builder, it could be a stonemason, it could be somebody who's a carpenter who's working primarily with wood, but it's, it's much more than simply, when we think carpenter, we think someone who works primarily with wood. But in, in Galilee, the primary building material was, was stones, it wasn't wood. So chances are that Jesus learned this trade from his father, uh, from Joseph, and so just as Joseph was a tectone, that is a, a builder, a worker in wood or stone or whatever needed to be used, so Jesus was as well. And as the Talmud will later say, and there's a quote on the right-hand side there, the Talmud probably reserves this ancient Jewish tradition that it's incumbent upon the father to circumcise his son, to redeem him, to teach him the law, and to teach him some occupation. And then this comment from R.T. France, his commentary on Mark, which I find very helpful, a tectone, so usually translated carpenter, but tectone is used predominantly of workers in wood, though it can be applied to craftsmen of other sorts, such as masons, sculptors, or smiths. In a small village, that is a small village like Nazareth, 
the Tectone would need to be versatile, able to deal both with agricultural and up other implements and also with the construction and repair of buildings. As such, he was the sig a significant figure in the village economy, probably also undertaking skilled work in the surrounding area. Now, why else were they objecting to him? So they knew that he was a, a Tectone, a carpenter, but they knew basically all about him. He grew up there. So they knew who he was. They had never seen him do, well, all the time he was growing up, they'd never seen him engage in any kind of miraculous wonders. And this is an important thing to keep in mind, by the way, because sometimes you will read in some, some text that are not part of the New Testament, but that supposedly preserve these uh, stories or traditions about Jesus, that he was you know, performing miracles as a little boy or maybe as a teenager. Well, those are most likely apocryphal. Those are most likely not true because his townspeople, the people that knew him, were astonished by all these things that were Jesus was doing and teaching. Well, if they'd grown up, if they'd seen him grow up working miracles, then none of this would have been surprising to them. So they're, they're shocked. They're amazed because the Jesus they see now and the Jesus that they've heard about, that doesn't match the Jesus who was the hometown boy growing up. So they know his mother, they know his brothers and his sisters, they know all about him. So where's this guy get his stuff? Where is this wisdom coming from? By the way, Joseph isn't mentioned here. Notice his brothers and sisters and, and his mother are mentioned. Probably, we, of course, the death of Joseph is not recorded, but it's almost universally agreed upon that by the time that Jesus began his ministry, Joseph had, had died. And of course, that's the reason he's never mentioned outside of the birth narratives about Jesus. What happens next? Well, that, what happens next is that Jesus speaks. He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So a, a kind of the, the, the proverbial uh, familiarity breeds contempt kind of situation. This particular kind of saying, by the way, was very common in the ancient world, often applied to philosophers, but here it's, of course, spoken of as prophets. Jesus, and the text goes on after Jesus says that, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled, thaumazo, we'll go back to that in just a minute. Jesus marveled, he was amazed, thaumazo, because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Now this particular verb I find fascinating, thaumazo, which is translated there as marveled, or it also can be translated amazed, because here's the thing, if you want to amaze Jesus, there's two ways to amaze him according to the New Testament documents, because there's only two times in the whole New Testament where Jesus is the subject of this particular verb. He thaumazos, he, he's amazed or he marvels. One is here, Mark 6, 6, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. So you don't want to amaze Jesus in that way by unbelief. And of course, keep in mind, these were the people who knew him best. They saw him grow up. They knew his family. They knew his trade. They thought they knew all about him, and yet they did not accept him as the Messiah. They did not believe in him. So that's one way to amaze Jesus. The second is recorded in Luke chapter 7, verse 9. When Jesus heard these things from the centurion, who of course is a Gentile, he's a Roman army officer. When Jesus heard these things from a non-Jew, from this Gentile centurion, he thaumazo. He marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, now listen to this, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So see how both times that Jesus is marveling or is amazed, it has to do with either the lack of faith or the presence of faith. And when Jesus marvels at the absence of faith, at unbelief, who's doing the unbelieving? The people who knew him, his hometown. These Israelites who knew all about the promises of the Messiah, but they couldn't reconcile these promises with this Jesus that they knew from childhood up. So his own people rejected him, and Jesus marveled at that. Then you get to the Roman centurion, and the Roman centurion once again made Jesus marvel or amazed him because he did believe. So we see here a theme that actually is echoed from the early early books of the scriptures all the way here into the gospels, where very often it is people that you don't think kind of fits your conception of those who would believe who do believe, and those who 
kind of fit your conception of those who do believe, don't believe. And so we see several examples of people outside the boundaries of Israel in the Old Testament itself who are believing in the true God. Just think of Rahab, for instance, in, in, in Jericho, or Naaman the Syrian who travels all the way to be cured by, of, of his skin disease. So that's just, just a couple of examples. We have people outside the bounds of the people of God who are believing, or very often those who are the in-group, as it were, those who should be believing, that you think should be believing, are not. They're rejecting the message. And this idea of Jesus being a prophet who is not accepted or believed in his hometown, this, this prophetic rejection theme is something that we see, again, all through the Old Testament. For instance, of course, Moses is the one that comes to mind right away. He was rejected repeatedly by his people, even to the point where they were ready to stone him. He who had been sent by God to bring them out of slavery, they were ready to stone him. So he was rejected by his own people. And then, of course, you see this perpetuated with Elijah and then his successor, Elisha, where they were certainly rejected by the kings under whom they prophesied. Going further on down, close to the Babylonian exile, in the 6th century, you've got Jeremiah, who is rejected by kings, is rejected by the, the priests, the religious leaders of the day, as well as by, as well as by the people. If you read through Jeremiah, you'll, you'll, you, you cannot help but see the anguish of soul that he experiences because no matter what he preaches, most of the time his preaching is rejected. And then this comes over into the New Testament with John the Baptist, who is this prophet like Elijah, who then is rejected by the religious leaders of his day and, of course, eventually loses his own life. So Jesus is placing himself into this prophetic stream. So he is a prophet, but of course, as we learn through the rest of the Gospels, he's a prophet, but he's infinitely more than just a prophet. He is the prophet like Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18, but he's not just a prophet. Of course, he's a priest, he's a king, he's a son of God, he's a son of man, he's God himself, he's Yahweh in the flesh. But Jesus accepts this kind of vocation of being a prophet and a rejected prophet at that. Now, this is a great way for us then to transition over into the second part of this particular pericope, and that has to do with how the rejection of Jesus as a prophet, as the, the one sent by God, is now going to lead into him sending out his 12 apostles two by two to cast out unclean spirits and to heal the sick and to proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, what we see in miniature here is something that is going to be perpetuated throughout the rest of the, of the New Testament, where... By and large, the message of Jesus the Messiah is not going to be received well or not going to be received at all. And what's going to happen? Well, what God is going to do is God is going to expand Israel. He's going to call people like Paul to travel all over the diaspora in the synagogues and elsewhere and to announce that Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to send others to go to Samaria and to the other most ends of the earth, in order that Israel, which of course was originally constituted as the 12 tribes, might not be ended, but expanded and continued. You see, here's the way it works. Jesus, a Jew, an Israelite from the tribe of David, uh, from the tribe of Judah, excuse me, a, a son of David, he comes as the, the fulfillment, the yes the, the yes with an exclamation point to all the promises of God. And then what happens? Well, th this promise is announced to his, his own people, to the Jews, and then it's announced to the Gentiles. And so Israel, far from ending or being replaced, is perpetuated and expanded and continued. So the Israel of God, not in the sense of just a certain nation on earth, like a, a geographically bound nation, but Israel as the people of God, as those who believe in the one true God, who believe in the Messiah whom he has sent, Israel is what we think of as the church. The church is Israel expanded and continued so that it's not just in one particular area of the world, but is now spread all over the world. So Israel, I live in Texas, Israel is in Texas. Some of you listening to this might live in Germany. Well, Israel is in Germany. 
Some of you listening to this might live in South Africa. Well, Israel is, is, is in South Africa. That is to say, the church has spread all over the world, and, and in so doing, Israel has spread all over the world. Now, how does this work? Well, notice what happens right after this rejection takes place. Let's think about this in kind of in, in big terms. So if you go back to the Old Testament, of course, you have the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 patriarchs of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob become, of course, the 12 tribes. And what do they do? Well, when they're brought out of Egypt, they conquer the promised land. Of course, this is recorded in the book of Joshua. You've got 12 tribes coming out of Egypt, led by Moses. They enter into the promised land. They conquer that according to the word of God. And this promised land is given to them as this holy land that they are to preserve until God decides that he is going to send the Messiah. Well, what happens in the New Testament? Well, now we have 12 apostles. You've got 12 tribes, you've got 12 apostles, 12 patriarchs, 12 apostles. Of course, the, the number is not simply chosen out of the air. It's chosen to mirror what happened in the Old Testament. So the 12 tribes now mirror the 12 apostles. And what do these 12 apostles do? Well, they go out and they conquer, but they don't conquer by the sword. They don't conquer by warfare. They conquer by preaching, by casting out evil spirits, by announcing the kingdom of God, by healing the sick, by doing all the things that Jesus told them to do. This is the means whereby they are conquering as, as Jesus sent them to do. And what do they conquer? Well, in this particular pericope, in Mark chapter 6, they're conquering those cities to, to which Jesus sends them, those villages to which he sends them. But at the end of Matthew, for instance, or the beginning of Acts, what's going to happen? They're going to be sent into all the world, into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost ends of the earth. So what's going to happen is this kingdom is going to be expanded. Israel is going to completely go outside its own borders because wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the kingship of Jesus is proclaimed and believed, wherever this son of David is worshipped, there is Israel. So where the church is, Israel is, because the church is Israel continued and expanded. All right, now let's see how this is described for us in these next few verses of Mark chapter 6. So Jesus calls the 12. He begins to send them out two by two. In the Greek, that's duo, duo, two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. So no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. We'll talk about that in just a second. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And there are several questions that arise here, so let's go through these bit by bit. First of all, why did he send them out two by two instead of solo? Well, probably because he was doing this just kind of a, a, to... to as an affirmation of things that we read several times in the Old Testament, such as Deuteronomy 17, 6, where facts, truths, testimony has to be established by two or three witnesses. So, they're, of course, they're companions one to another, but also this helps to affirm the truthfulness of that which they are proclaiming. Secondly, why are they traveling so light? Well, probably because this, this is a way in which they are depending upon the generosity of those to whom they preached. So they're not, they're not relying upon their own wherewithal. They're not relying upon their own way to provide for themselves. They are completely dependent upon the generosity or the mercy of those to whom they are sent to preach. Thirdly, why are they staying with families? You know, why aren't they getting a room in the Hilton? Well, of course, because they, those kind of opportunities that we are so used to in our culture were not there. If they were, they were very limited. Most of the time when you traveled you stayed with family or friends, or you stayed with someone who was hospitable enough, to, hospitable enough to welcome you into their home. So Middle Eastern, that Middle Eastern culture of hospitality was very much at work here in the reason that Jesus sent them the way that he did. Now, of course, some of the places where they were going to go were not going to welcome them. Some were, and some, some were not. So what happens if a place did not welcome them? And here we already pick, we're already picking up on the fact 
that what happened in Nazareth with Jesus is going to happen with some of his apostles. Because some places Jesus went, they accepted him, they welcomed him, they received him, they rejoiced that he was there. And some places like Nazareth was quite the opposite. Same thing's going to happen with those whom Jesus sends. These apostles that he sends out, these apostles that he apostles, these sent ones that he sends, well, some places are going to receive them and some places are not. Well, if they don't, if the message is rejected, here's what Jesus tells them to do. He says, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now, thankfully, this isn't the only place in the New Testament where we have this kind of language. If you look in Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust from their feet against them, that is, the ones who rejected them, and they went on to Iconium. Acts 18, no dust is mentioned, but notice what Paul does. When they opposed and reviled Paul, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, this is when he sends out the 70 or the 72. He says, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now, why was the dust shaken off? Well, obviously, it's a parabolic action, very much like the parabolic actions of many of the prophets, such as Ezekiel and and Jeremiah in the Old Testament, where they would sometimes act out their oracles, sort of a a nonverbal sermon, if you will. So this shaking off of the dust is saying we, we are rejecting and leaving behind even these tiny particles of dust which we have picked up while staying with you as a testimony against you. There very well could be something which is recorded much later by the rabbis where when the rabbis would leave Gentile lands, they would wipe off the dust from their feet because these Gentile lands were understood to be defiled and they didn't want to bring this defiled soil with them back into the Holy Land. If, and that is if, if that kind of understanding was circulating in the first century, this underscores even more the fact that these disciples are saying, you know what? If you, if you are going to reject the message of the kingdom of God and the Messiah, then even the dust on our feet we're going to leave behind because you have, by your rejection of God's will and God's ways, you have brought defilement upon your community. You have, you have chosen to remain unclean by not welcoming this cleansing message of the kingdom of God. And so we leave this unclean soil, which you have defiled by your rebellion and your unbelief, even, we, even that we leave behind you. Well, that is a very quick run-through of of the gospel reading. I think this is a a tremendous reading by which to illustrate what we're going to see happening through the rest of the gospels and into the rest of the New Testament, where this message that Jesus brings of who he is and what he has done is going to be taken by people like Paul and Peter and others, and it's going to be expanded to where we have an Ethiopian eunuch hearing this message, and he's going to take that message back with him. So where he is believing in the Messiah and presumably gathering others around him who believe in the Messiah, there is Israel. It's going to be taken north. It's going to be taken all over the place by Paul. And of course, today it is all over the world. This is the way that God has expanded and continued his people so that still today people are being added to the number of those who believe. That is people being added to Israel, people being added to the kingdom of God where the Messiah is preached and believed where there is faith there the spirit is present to continue to expand the kingdom of god thanks for watching if this has been helpful to you as i hope it has then share it with your friends one note if you're a a regular watcher of of these videos i usually put these out on monday i am going to be unable to produce these for the next two weeks i'm going to be on on vacation for one week, and then I'm going to be on a, a speaking event in New Jersey on that second week. So for two weeks, there will be no videos, but when I come back, I will restart these again. So thank you for watching, and may God watch over each of you and grant you his grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. We'll see you in two or three weeks. Thanks.